Hi, this is Annie Grace, and welcome to this Naked Mind podcast. Okay, so I always say that I'm super excited about my guests, um, but today, like, I'm super, super excited about my guest. I came across Isabel's work, must have been close to four years ago, and it was through a mutual friend, a good high school buddy of mine, and he introduced me to her work, and I was, like, struck because, like, oh my gosh, Isabel is doing for food what I have been helping people with for alcohol, and so luckily our paths just actually crossed in real life recently and i'm like kind of geeking out a bit because i've been like super uh fan girl for for isabel but anyway welcome isabel fox and duke thank you for being here thank you so much for having me this is so fun it's awesome so you um isabel's founded stopfightingfood.com and i think the best place to to start is like we'll get into all the cool stuff and all the techniques and and everything else but i think the best place to start really is just kind of with your own story and your own journey and and how you got to to found this amazing company yeah so you know my story i when i was you know i used to think it was really unique and that there was like something deeply uniquely wrong with me around food um and now i realize i'm actually not that unique and there are lots of people um who have a very similar story to mine like sort of slightly edited from you know little details here or there but um basically i was uh put on a dot on my first diet when i was a really really young kid i was like kind of like a chubby baby, so to speak. I don't know. I was like high on the baby BMI scale or whatever. And um, my pediatrician at the time, you know, told my parents, oh, you got to watch your weight. And so I was, I was put on my first diet when I was really, really, really young. Um, and as a result, you know, I, I was, you know, constantly since the beginning of time, since literally the beginning of time that I can remember, felt like my body wasn't good enough, um, felt like I really had to like be careful around food all the time. I had to like be, you know, just constantly, you know, worrying, okay, don't eat too much, don't eat this, don't eat that. You know, there was like always like a new way that I had to try to kind of control my food and and, and try to control my weight. Um, constant body image issues growing up as a kid. And, and again, like, I never spoke about this stuff, but I, I now recognize after doing this work, oh, this is how most women to some extent feel for one reason or another. And, you know, the degree to which this happens might change, or maybe the time that it might happen might change um, in, in a person's life. But this is a you know really common experience, right? Like women going on diets in our culture not uncommon. But one of the things that happened, uh, you know, as a result of my dieting was, again, this, this feeling like um, I had to constantly control myself around food. And one of the sort of results of that, and I didn't realize that this was a result of it, was that I, I constantly felt like my hunger was insatiable. Like if I didn't actively try to control my food, I would just eat everything that was in sight and I would just like never stop. And um, one of the things that ended up happening was that I would literally have like, you know, as time went on in my sort of dieting career, I would literally have moments where I would just, you know, fall off the wagon and it would be like, okay, like the floodgates have opened and I would just, you know, run, rummage through my cabinets eating everything that wasn't nailed down, right? And so you know, these sort of periods of, you know, got to stay in control, got to lose weight, got to stick to the whatever plan, you know, got to not do this with food, got to just only do this other thing with food. You know, those periods of being in control would be followed by these periods of being really out of control, really feeling quite out of control, you know, and, you know, eventually I kind of learned this language of binge eating basically, right? Like I would periods of being really in control, periods of like sticking to the thing. This time I'm going to get it. This time I'm going to lose the weight. This time I'm going to keep it off. This time's going to be different. And then like, whoosh, like on the other side, it would be like at some point I just couldn't sit on my hands trying not to eat any longer. It would be like, I would be overcome by this energy of like, Food, 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 right? It would like I would see something. I would like see a piece of something out of the corner of my eye, or I'd be at a dinner par dinner party, or you know something would happen, or I'd you know just have an uncomfortable emotion, like an itchy feeling, where I'd be like ah, right, and I couldn't I couldn't hang on anymore, right? This this will powering to try to control my food. I just couldn't, I would have a moment where I just couldn't do it anymore. And I would just completely just go the other way, right? Like I would just, and, and, and these sort of oscillations between, you know, dieting, controlling, restricting, hanging on, willpowering, muscling through it, you know, what's the right diet? What's the right plan? Maybe it's this, maybe it's that, right? Those periods of being on the wagon and those periods of being off the wagon, right? These oscillations back and forth on and off would get 
more and more severe in either direction as time goes on. So basically, as I got older, you know, moving through, you know, middle school, high school, et cetera, right? Like these oscillations would get more and more intense, right? Like the restrictive periods, the like, I'm going to do it this time would get like even more fervent. And I'd be like, even more convinced that like this time I'm going to get it. And then the binges would be like even more intense, right? And the binges, they, they seem to mirror the intensity of the diet almost. It was like the more I dieted and the longer over the course of my life that I dieted, the more intense and the more aggressive the binges would be. And, you know, now I really understand that there, you know, we'll talk a little bit more about this, but, you know, this is, this is the common experience, right? Like this diet binge cycling, which now is the language I use to describe it, is just more, is progressive, right? We actually as a species get usually typically worse at dieting over time. We have less capacity to hang on over time um, and the binges get more and more and more intense. And there's evolutionary reasons for this and all psychological reasons for this and all sorts of reasons for this. Um, but basically this diet binge cycling got so, so, so intense um, that, you know, kind of long story short, I ended up eventually in rehab for binge eating disorder. And um, that really started what I would call like the second half of the story where it was like, okay, what's the solution to this? And really having trouble finding the solution in, you know, sort of traditional clinical paths. I mean, lots of confusion around how to treat binge eating disorder in our culture. You know, our culture is really committed to dieting. We're really committed to, you know, you know, you can do it. Just hang on willpower. Like, you know, that is the status quo, even in the medical field around, you know, you know, weight management in quotes and all of these things. So, um, you know, now I sort of recognize like, oh, these periods of being out of control are really actually quite connected to, you know, trying to get our food under control and that they're actually sort of two sides of the same coin. But it took me quite a long time to understand that and not only understand that just sort of basic concept, but like the nuances psychologically of what's involved in that. Because, you know, letting go of, um, dieting and letting go of control around food is just incredibly terrifying in our culture for people. Like people are like, oh my God, what's going to happen to me? Like all hell is going to break loose. Because again, that's usually the dieter's experience. The second they let go, it's like all hell breaks loose. So, you know, recovering from, you know, these, this, this restrictive hanging on willpower model um, is usually quite uh, complicated emotionally for people um, and requires a lot of changing of thinking about, you know, how we operate around food and, you know, kind of getting back in touch with, oh, like you're actually a human animal. Like you have biological instincts around food. You're not necessarily meant to sit on your hands trying to eat, you know, and, and mindfulness work and connecting back with yourself and all of these sorts of different issues that really, you know, kind of in the end, you know, collectively became, you know, what I found to be the real solution. And it was, you know, the reason I do this work was because it was so hard to find those answers in a culture that is constantly kind of encouraging the problem um, yeah. rather than encouraging the solution. So that, that's, that's the shortest version of my story I think I've ever given. So uh, that's so, I mean, it's, uh, there's so much there. Like, I feel like, um, first of all, in drinking there, I mean, if you really like wanted to d very dumbly distill it down to um, people who are really questioning their relationship with alcohol. They're questioning it because it started to create a problem in their lives, right? And they're really, if you want to dumb it down there, you could say there's two types and there's this huge spectrum. So I feel like even silly saying this, but there's people who drink all the time, um, pretty much every single day. And they're drinking not enough to like black out or go crazy or fall down the stairs or anything like that, but they're doing it every single day. And then there's people who are binging. And there's people who are just living for the weekends, going crazy on the weekends, but then they're absolutely committed to not drinking. Every binge makes them even more committed to not doing the next binge. And on both sides of this coin, the people who are drinking every single day, that's who I was. And I think you can really compare that to food, people who overeat every day, and then people who binge with food. And um, on, I was on the every single day, right? And so I'd be like, well, well, I'm not them. Like, I'm not falling down the stairs. I'm not, I'm not binging. I'm not falling apart once a week. Right. But then on the binge side, 
they're looking at me saying, okay, well, I don't drink every day. Like you're drinking a bottle plus of wine every day, right? And so there's this whole dichotomy and we think, okay, these actually are things that have to be treated differently. We have to treat binging differently than we have to treat like this regular drinking. But that's actually like in my work, I found that's not true. So anyway, I just thought I'd bring that up because I, I, I found as you were talking about that, I was like, oh my gosh, this is the same cycle. This is the same thing happening in the brain. There's not actually any difference. And just to say that like the thing that I get asked about more than anything else. And I keep having, you know, different guests around um, who are experts around like food and sugar who have found these methodologies that really work better is okay, Annie, I've, I've sort of sorted out the drinking, but now I've switched to eating. I've switched to food. Like now I'm finding my comfort in this, you know, bag of Oreos at the end of the day or whatever. And so anyway, wow. I just found it fascinating. It's interesting because, you know, and this topic comes up a lot and this is really, really important is like, so what are the differences between, you know, recovering from like a problematic or complicated relationship with alcohol versus recovering from a problematic or complicated relationship with food? And like, the truth is, is like, there are, while there are some similarities, there are also a lot of important differences. And I think it's important to cover those as well. So um, one of the issues with food is that in a lot of instances, um, you know, food is a biological instinct and alcohol is not, right? And so one of the things that I think gets really, really complicated about food is that um, when, you know, emotional eating, right? What you're talking about, like eating for comfort is very, very, very heavily correlated with dieting and with body image issues, right? And just like, you know, beliefs that my food should look different. Um, and so, you know, with like quote unquote emotional eating, overeating, binge eating, you know, all compulsive eating, whatever you want to call it, you know, these things almost always go hand in hand with attempts to control a, a biological instinct that was never meant to be controlled. So that is um, a little bit different, right? Like this concept of overeating, you know, doesn't usually come out of nowhere just for the sake of coping. It always goes hand in hand with this other thing called dieting that tends to be, can be really compulsive for people and they don't even necessarily recognize it as compulsive because it's so culturally mandated, right? Like, of course I'm supposed to be on a diet. Of course I'm supposed to be constantly trying to control my weight, right? Of course I'm supposed to be thin, 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 right? And so it's like that thinking is often actually what's driving both emotional eating behaviors and binge eating behaviors. And I think it would be really important for us to distinguish between those two things and what those things are. Um, but both of those behaviors are really correlated with this like, other third thing happening called, I hate my body. I think I should be trying to control my food. I need to be thinner. I need to get on the diet. Diet starts tomorrow. Tomorrow, I'm not going to eat this way. Tomorrow, I'm not going to do this, you know, et cetera, et cetera. And, and all the different mindsets around that. And so that's, that's I think, you know, a really, really important distinction between alcohol and food. And quite frankly, I think what ends up happening is when people stop drinking, practically what's also happening is that they're getting a lot less calories, Tr like truly. Yeah. And so yeah. in, in a lot of instances, when people quit drinking, they actually end up like getting those calories in other ways and then just flagellate themselves for it. Or they, you know, are eating their like diety food and then they're like, why do I want cookies at the end of the night? And it's like, there's this really, um, there's a, a tendency to be like, oh, you know, it's emotional, it's for comfort because the assumption is I should be able to stick to like what my healthy food plan looks like or what I think my food should look like. When in reality, for a lot of people, that's just simply not enough food. So, and especially if you have a comp, you know, a previous history with alcohol or drugs, and, and I'll speak for myself, part of my story was drug use to try to control my food. And so I was, you know, have like a whole complicated history with that, that as well. Um, but it's very, very easy to be like, oh, food is just like alcohol. It's the same thing. And it's, 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 in many instances, actually, there are very specific differences. And the major, 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 major difference is dieting, right? And the impacts of dieting on how we, um, like how we operate around food. Like if you're a person who has a history of dieting, has a history of trying to control food, has a history of body image issues, you're the likelihood of you, you know, using food for coping or comfort goes up 
like infinitely. Um, the likelihood of you having like diet binge cycling episodes or feeling like these sort of on and off the wagon feelings around food go up infinitely, right? And so that's super, super important. It's almost like in order to end the cycle with food, we also have to end the cycle with dieting. And for most people, they don't even, it's like, oh, that's not a problem for me. My problem is that I overeat. My problem isn't that I diet. And I'm like, mm, they're two sides of the same coin. They go together, right? And so, you know, that's, I think, just an important thing to just, I always like to talk about whenever we're having a conversation about the differences between like classic addictions, right? Like substance abuse addictions versus basically disordered eating patterns, whether they be, you know, binge eating or under eating typically go together. Um, you know, dieting, emotional eating typically go together, right? We call these, these are process disorders, right? So um, it's not just the food that's, you know, it's not quote unquote, overeating that's happening in a vacuum. There's this other thing called, you know, dieting and body shame and, you know, feeling like I constantly needing to be control my food that's also happening. And um, that can be quite compulsive as well. But we, of course, don't call it a compulsion because it's socially sanctioned. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And I think I really appreciate that clarification because I think it is so important to talk about because for, for one thing, you can't just, and people have told me this all the time, like I picked up your book for chocolate, but it didn't work. I was like, well, it's because they're different things, right? Like it's not going to work for chocolate. And that is a huge reason I wanted to invite you here today to have this yeah. conversation. But I do think as you were talking, I did notice another um, similarity that might be worth just a, a quick conversation about is that what, what it took for me to really get back in control in my relationship with alcohol is I had to stop trying to stop drinking. Yeah. Were yeah. Like what, what do you mean? Like I was on the diet cycle with alcohol. I felt like I was on a constant diet because I, our culture again says you have to drink responsibly drinking responsibly means different things. By the way, that probably came from the alcohol industry to begin with. But anyway, that's a tangent. But drinking responsibly means different things to different people. And so when you realize you're on the edge or the fringe of responsibility, or you realize you're on the fringe of like, this is creating a problem or pain in my life, then what do you do? You automatically start to reduce it or restrict it. And mm -hmm. although I totally agree with you, alcohol is not a biological need. Initially, it right. becomes a psychological need at a very deep level because it is an addictive substance. So like the dopamine release makes it into something that your body actually does think is vital for survival. And so that does happen. And so then when you try the people who have the most problems with alcohol are not necessarily people who are just drinking whenever they want to drink. It is the people who have realized that drinking whenever they want to drink isn't getting there and them anywhere good. And then they start trying to reduce their drinking and boom, all of the sudden things escalate That's to wrong. a point where it's like crazy town, right? And that um, was really, so after a few years of that cycle, when I said, okay, I'm gonna stop trying to stop drinking, and I'm gonna approach this from a different way, I'm gonna start learning about why in the world do I wanna drink so much in the first place? What else is going on? What's below the surface? That's when I was finally successful. So anyway, I just, I just and that's why I just love your work so much is because I, I do feel like, yes, there's differences, but also like we're coming at this in a very similar way. Yeah, I mean, totally. Because it's like, I mean, it's like the, there's the sort of biological aspects of food, but, and then also psychological aspects of food, like the kid who's in the store being told not to touch, touch, touch the toy, wants to touch the toy more. And that is a hundred percent, a hundred percent true with food, right? Like if you're shaming yourself for something you're eating, if you're trying to like, oh my gosh, I'm not going to eat this anymore. I'm not going to eat this way anymore. Even, and this is interesting because this probably does relate to food, like even quote unquote emotional eating, right? Like if I say, oh my gosh, I shouldn't be emotionally eating and I'm flagellating myself for emotionally eating, even that can trigger this sort of like, okay, like all I want to do is eat kind of like reactionary eating, falling off the wagon kind of eating. Um, it's really interesting. Like I used to, one of the, my last diet. So a after I went to rehab for binge eating disorder and also there was like the drug stuff and all of that, but typically I just focus on the binge eating disorder because that's my, my cup of tea. But, um, after I got out of rehab, you know, I was like trying out all of these different things because all these different experts were telling me different, you know, methods of treating it. And one of the various things that I think was one of the most popular things, even today, one of the most popular attitudes towards healing binge eating is the sort of like, you know, um, don't, is like, don't eat emotionally. I, I used to call it the don't eat emotionally diet 
where instead of like non-judgmentally looking at our feelings and being like, huh, that's interesting. Like I've noticed, like I'm not hungry, but you know, there's this, you know, thing I'm like kind of having like an itchy feeling. I'm uncomfortable. I'm having like a little craving. I want to like, you know, let it go. Instead of looking at that non-judgmentally and actually just like giving yourself the choice to do it if you want to do it, but like also being aware of your feelings and like being mindful, but like without this feeling of I can't do it. Like it's, I also call it the mindfulness diet sometimes where you're like trying to be mindful so that you don't do it. Right. And it's like, you're trying to trick your brain into not doing the thing through like mindfulness or through whatever. And it's like, that doesn't work either. It's like your subconscious knows what you're up to. Like you actually really do have to look at the behavior non-judgmentally and be like, you know what? Like if I want a cookie for no reason, other than the fact that like I'm sad and I want comfort, like that's okay. Like that really is not the end of the world. Like it's a cookie, like it's fine. And even if it's 10 cookies that fine. Although I, I will say typically, and this is a really good opportunity to talk about the differences between binge eating and emotional eating, right? Typically when we're just like feeling sad and mm, I want a little comfort, mm, it'll just be like a cupcake and I'm going to watch some TV and maybe have some ice cream. When it's like 10 pints of ice cream or when it's like rummaging through your cabinets, like, oh, you know, wild man, like that's usually a reaction. That's like usually a straight up reaction to deprivation, right? That's not just, I'm sad. I want a cookie. That is, I'm falling falling off the wagon, might as well eat everything that isn't nailed down because diet starts tomorrow or like I can't hold myself back from like eating this thing one second longer, right? So there's the two different experiences and this is, this is a part of my video training series that you saw, right? Is the difference between I'm sad, I want a cookie and oh my gosh, I fell off the wagon, you know, I screwed up, I might as well just like eat my entire like cabinet kitchen like contents and then like diet starts tomorrow, right? Those are two very different experiences. Experiences. And I think, of course, you know, sometimes they can overlap, right? Like maybe I'm sad I want a cookie it turns into, oh my God, you're so bad you had a cookie, you're off the wagon, you might as well eat the whole box and tomorrow starts day one, right? They can, there, there's some overlap, but fundamentally these are different experiences, right? And so like in my mind, I'm like, emotional eating, like there is no one who eats food just for fuel and nothing else. Like that is not a thing. Like that's not even a healthy thing. Like I would call that like a restrictive disordered thing. Um, like food is meant for pleasure. Like it's okay. You know, I don't know anyone who doesn't occasionally have a cookie for no other reason other than the fact that like it tastes good and it feels good and it's comforting and like yummy. Um, but you know, what we can avoid, right? Like what actually can stop is this, oh my God, I suck. I shouldn't have broken, you know, I broke my diet. I fell off the wagon. I might as well eat the whole contents of my cabinets and then diet starts tomorrow, right? Like that's a behavior that actually can be, we can be rid of for good. And one of the reasons that I think people stay in the diet binge cycle, even through all these like mindfulness practices and all of this intuitive eating and, you know, et cetera, is that they treat it like the mindfulness diet. They treat it like the don't eat emotionally diet. They treat it like, you know, I fell off the wagon. I crossed some imaginary line of it's not okay anymore. And now I'm like off to the racism off the wagon, you know? And so it's super, super important to kind of like, really give yourself permission. Like the first step to ending binge eating is giving yourself permission, full, true emotional permission to eat whatever you want, whenever you want it. Um, and that's so scary for people. And that's like the number one objective. Well, fine. Then I'll just weigh 500 pounds. Like how does, how do they like navigate that? Here's a complicated question. So again, first of all, one of the magical things that happens is that when you actually really do give yourself permission and overcome your fear of food and aren't like constantly like an anxiety mode around it, you notice that food loses its power, right? Like mm -hmm. this, you know, like biologically speaking, like we're not driven to just eat nee, 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 forever, right? Like there actually comes a point of satiation but that point of satiation that like quote unquote normal eaters experience, that point of satiation can only come in a land of permission. It can only come in a land of allowance. It can only come when we get out of our own way and allow our biological instincts to take over rather than us trying to interfere with our, through our willpower. When we try to interfere through our own willpower, right? What ultimately ends up happening is like our biological instinct, our biological drive to eat like freaks out. It's like, oh my gosh, she's putting me on the diet. She's going to starve me tomorrow. Better get it in now, right? Like it actually triggers a hoarding behavior, right? So these, you know, if you're, you know, if you're a person who's struggling with like binge eating, basically, um, 
binge eating immediately basically diminishes once you're like actually allowed to have the cookie. Like if you were just allowed to have a cookie whenever you want, or even allowed to have two or three cookies whenever you, you know, were allowed to have it, it probably wouldn't turn into a whole, the whole box. Um, that being said, I think that there are instances, of course, physiologically when people do eat the whole box, whether they're allowing it or not, because they're not eating enough during the day because they're dieting or because, you know, you know, all of these different other physical restrictions. And this is another, you know, kind of distinction between alcohol and food is that because we live in a diet culture, people are basically constantly running around either trying to um, under eat, either trying to restrict their food, trying to eat not as much as they actually need, or actively not eating as much as they need, and then wonder why, you know, they kind of lose it in a box of cookies, you know, a couple days in or whatever. Um, so there's, there's these two things happening with food. One is physical, right? One is just straight up, like if you don't give yourself enough calories, and the vast majority of women in our culture are not told that, that they need as many calories as they actually do, right? The vast majority of women in our culture are just like actively trying to under eat on a regular basis. Um, and then wonder why they like break their diet or like lose it or have the box of cookies or whatever, you know, ever so often. Um, and it's really just, you know, in many instances, it's like your body's just catching up. Like it's just literally a physical reaction. Um, but then there's also this like kid in a toy store being told not to touch the toys thing, right? That we kind of reference. There's that like psychological aspect of like, even if I was eating, even if I was really, truly giving myself like good, large, hearty meals, you know, really allowing myself to like consume the amount of calories my body truly needs, really satisfying myself physically, you know, letting myself eat what I want. If I go, if I emotionally am feeling like, oh my gosh, I shouldn't be doing this. This isn't okay. My brain is like in this like judgment zone of like, I should be trying to control this. I shouldn't be doing this, which just, again, it just makes you want to hoard the thing. It's like the kid in the toy store being told not to touch the toy. So there's like levels of how restriction can lead to binge eating or lead to sort of these like compulsive eating behaviors, right? There's physical um, levels, there's emotional levels, right? And, you know, really it's like, with food in particular, there has to be like a really, really deep surrender when you have like a really, really deep surrender of like, I'm just done. I mean, this is, this is, I'll just speak for myself. I finally got to a point where I was just on the merry-go-round of like trying every single type of control mechanism, like whether it be the emotional eating diet or the, you know, I call it, I sometimes also call that like the hunger and fullness diet when you're like, I'm only allowed to eat when I'm hungry and I have to stop when I'm full, which is like, you know, it comes out of, um, uh, when you sort of distort intuitive eating concepts, if anyone's familiar with that, you know, and then I was like, there was like periods where I was in OA and 12 step programs and like, I've got to cut out the sugar and I've got to cut out the flour and I've got to, can't do this, can't do that. Right? It was like just always next control mechanism after the other. And I remember never being successful long-term at any of them. Like I would always crack, always, always. And I remember at some point I was coming off of this like horrible, painful binge, such a painful binge that I like couldn't go into work the next day. And I just had this sort of like deep realization, like I, I give up, like I can't, I can't control this. Like I give up, like I actually give up trying to make this different. Like I, I don't care anymore. Like I'm just like, whatever I end up eating is whatever I end up eating. Like my life revolving around trying to control my food and trying to be big and trying to be smaller all the time. Like this is not a way to live. Like I feel obsessed with food. I feel crazy around food. I like my whole life is now just revolving around how to, you know, make myself thinner and how to make myself not eat the wrong way in quotes. I just can't do this anymore. I'm done. And if I gain weight, fine. I don't care. Like that's how I got, like that was the level of like desperation that I got that I, I actually overcame my fear of weight gain. I was like, I don't, I don't give a shit. Like I was like, this is not worth it. Like I cannot live this way anymore. I cannot live constantly trying to control my food, constantly losing control. I just cannot do this anymore. And I just like really let go. I was like, you know what? I don't care anymore. I'm going to just eat whatever. And if I gain weight, fine, screw it. And what ended up happening was that it was like in that moment, that was when food kind of lost its power over me. You know, like I, you know, I think, you know, I gained a little bit of weight. Like I was, you know, kind of, you know, again, eating big hearty meals, just sort of enjoying food, eating all the desserts that I wanted, but like, you know, also having like real food for the first time in my life, like going to a restaurant and like ordering the pasta bolognese for the first time in my life, like with no fear or shame or without thinking any of that was weird and just 
really feeding myself and just letting go and just having fun and enjoying my life. And, um, it was like, I never binged again. Like it was like, there was nothing to be, there was nothing to rebel against. Like it was just like, Oh yeah, I'm just eating. Like, I'm just like enjoying my life, having my food, like no big deal. I'm just eating. And did I, you know, sometimes eat emotionally and eat my feelings? Yeah, sure. Like I'd have like, Oh, I'm sad. I'm going to go have an ice cream, but it was never those like wild binge eating. Like I'm going rummaging through my cabinets, eating everything nailed down until I feel sick to my stomach. Like that literally never happened again. It was just you know, well, this is me just eating. And, you know, I, at some point my weight just became a weight, you know, like I like gained a little bit of weight in the first like year or two maybe. And it wasn't like so dramatic. I mean, I think different people have different experiences depending on how much they're restricting. Like if you're like a crazy, crazy dieter and you're really like weight suppressing your natural weight, you know, you're gonna, you're gonna gain weight and you probably need to. Um, but for me, like I was never a very successful dieter. So, you know, I was already pretty close to my natural weight and I just kind of, you know, eventually I think I gained like a tiny bit of weight coming off of my last like little control effort. And like, that was it. I was just, food just, it just, it, it, it emotionally stopped being an issue for me. Cause I was like, I just don't care about this anymore. Like screw it. And as a result, like I wasn't constantly just thinking about food, 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 all the time, which of course it's like, you know, it's like that pink elephant thing. Like, it's like, don't think about a pink elephant. Don't think about a pink elephant. Like don't eat pink elephants. Don't eat pink. Elephants. It's like, all you do is want to eat pink elephants, you know, like, you know, like, and so it was the same thing as like, once I just let go and was like, I can't even worry about this anymore. Like, I don't care. I just, all of a sudden my, you know, I, I gave myself the space to just think about other things and just like have a life outside of food and food, you know, I, I didn't like ha acquire some like dream body or anything, but I got a life. Like I got a life outside of food. Like my life didn't revolve around food anymore. And I just became a weight that is just easy and natural for me. Right. Like I'm not a supermodel, but like my weight, I literally, my weight hasn't changed in eight years. Like that's m most people with food issues cannot say that. Right. Like most people with food issues are going up and down, up and down their whole lives. And that was me. Like I had a 40 pound up and down spread in high school, like when I was a young person. Um, and like, you know, now I literally have been wearing the same jean size for eight years. Again, like I'm not some like dream body. I'm not like the same size that like in my fantasy, I was like trying to get to back then but I'm just a size that's easy and natural for me to maintain, right? Like, it's just like, yep, and like, I eat what I want. Sometimes I eat cookies when I'm sad, and it's just, it's just no big deal. It's just my body is just doing its thing. I'm out of the way. I've dropped the reins. I'm, st I'm not the one trying to, like, control it anymore. It's just happening by biology, by nature, right? And um, yeah, and it's just like so freeing. It's like, okay, I remember when I was in rehab, this was after I like went through my period where I was like doing drugs to control my weight. Like I was like doing a lot of Coke to try to control my weight. And um, when I, uh, dr like basically I remember thinking when Did I went- Did it work rehab, by the way? What? <laughs> Did it work? Oh yeah, I lost a ton of weight. I mean, I ended up in rehab. So like, what's your definition of working? You know, work? like, yeah. yeah, like, did it work? I mean, like I lost weight, good for me, but like I literally ended up in a rehab facility and had to drop out of school. Like, nah, working? Uh, I don't know. <laughs> like, so, you know, but I remember thinking like, okay, if I gain, you know, I had like an X number of pounds, like, okay, well, if I like gain, you know, a certain number of pounds, I'm just going to go back to drugs. Like, I was like, I'll give this recovery thing a shot. But like, if I gain a certain amount of weight, like I'm going back to drugs. And, you know, now I'm well beyond that size. But it's like, I just realized now I'm like, oh, this is just where my body wants to be. Like, I don't, I'm not fighting my body anymore. And I think, you know, to answer your question, like, you know, how are people not 500 pounds in quotes? Like, it's like, I would encourage you to think about like your quote unquote normal eater friends, right? Like who don't have food issues. Like they're not trying to control anything. They're not trying to force themselves to be a certain size. They just are the size that they are. Like our bodies actually have, it's called weight set point. Are you familiar with this weight set point theory? Have we talked mm -hmm. about this? Oh my God, this is so important. Okay. So um, your body actually has like a natural, like genetically determined size that it kind of is trying to be, right? Like in the absence of interference, and we can talk about what interference means. There's a lot of few different definitions, but dieting would definitely be an interference, right? In the absence of interference, when you think about just like 
quote unquote normal eaters who are just going about their life, like not really giving a shit, just like eating when they feel like eating. Sometimes they might eat cookies for no reason. Sometimes not, not a big deal, but like mostly they're just living their life, not thinking about food, which is the dream. Like that's what I actually eventually got to the point where I was like, this is my goal is sanity. Wherever my weight ends up, I don't care. I want sanity. Um, and you know, those normal eaters, right? Like they're not 500 pounds necessarily just because when, because they're not controlling their food. They just are, they just have a weight. Some of them are a little bit bigger. Some of them are smaller. Some of them are this size, some of that size, but they have a weight that they just kind of are, that they just sort of stay at, right? And it's just, that's their genetically predisposed weight, you know, like this is, there is so much science around this. Like, you know, if you have like any friends who are normal leaders, you'll notice that your, your normal leader friends are probably roughly different sizes and they kind of just look like themselves every time you see them because that's just the weight they are, right? Like, and so when we get out of our own way, we, our body is sort of working to kind of get to this genetically predisposed weight. Um, I think what gets complicated is that some people's genetically predisposed weights are higher than other people's. And in our culture, we have like a real assumption that like, if you're a higher weight person, that means that you must be doing something wrong with food and you're really screwing up and there's something wrong with you. And that's just not scientifically accurate. Like there are actually really healthy people who just happen to be a little, you know, bigger. And that's, it's just the way their bodies are designed, right? Um, and so a big part of this is like, I didn't know any of this science when I let go. I was just got to a point of desperation where I was like, I just don't care. Like if I gain weight, I don't care. Like I just, I have to get out of this hell of obsessing about my food all of the time. Um, but after I had this experience of like really letting go and just like eating what I want, like not worrying about it. And like, just, I just arrived at this weight. Like I gained a little weight and at some point my weight just stopped changing. Like it was just like, boop you're here, you've made it. And again, my weight's been the same for eight years through every vacation, through all the foods ups and downs, through like mono and through, you know, maybe there's like minor tiny fluctuations, but for the most part, I've been wearing the same pant size for eight years because this is clearly just my natural body size. Like this is just where my body wants to be. And so, you know, I think, you know, what ends up happening is when we interfere, when we try to shove our natural weight down, that's when we binge, right? Like that's when we rebound. Like this is why people say 95% of diets fail. What that really means when you hear the statistic, 95% of diets fail, what that actually means is that 95% of people who try to lose weight are going to gain it back. 95% of people who try to weight suppress, this is new language, right? 95% of people who try to suppress their natural weight are going to gain it back, right? If you are, you know, if your body has a weight that it's just like trying to hang out at, if you try to push it down below where it wants to be, you're going to rebound. It's just physiology. And quite frankly, if you don't rebound, you have bigger problems because that probably means that you have like, you know, now we're talking like restrictive eating disorder land, right? Like you're probably obsessed with food. You're obsessed with working out. You're like, don't have a life because your life revolves around dieting, right? Like this is what happens with like successful weight suppressors. Like there's like been all these studies about like the very rare five percenters who like are able to keep off more than like a substantive amount of weight, like more than 30, 40 pounds, whatever. And those those people who are able to do that are typically pretty obsessed with food. Like they are, it is a full-time job to keep off 40, 40 pounds, you know? Like, like, um, and so, you know, this is, this is, you know, of course there are like outliers and exceptions, but by and large, for the most part, when we look at the data, this is what we see. Most people have a weight that their bodies kind of want to be. And if you try to suppress it, you're going to gain it back. Um, and that has nothing to do with addiction, right? Like that is, physiological. What we also do happen to know though, kind of like as a side note, um, is that people who are engaging in weight suppressing behaviors are more likely to have these like out of control eating episodes when they're having uncomfortable feelings. And there's a lot of theories as to why that is, right? Um, number one is that like, you know, when you're having uncomfortable feelings, the first thing that goes out the door is willpower. If willpower mm. is a strategy, uncomfortable feelings are going to hit, the, nick that right out the door. Right. So yeah. So this is kind of like a long, complicated answer to your question. <laughs> I love it though. I'm so, this is, this is just, I mean, it's really news to me and it's just absolutely fascinating. So would you say that obviously we definitely have an obesity crisis right now. Um, would you say that dieting is one of the causes of that? 
Um, it's complicated. So, and, and in my opinion, I actually don't use the term obesity crisis. Okay. Um, I actually, yeah. So this is where we're getting back into the weight discrimination conversation. Like what I say, we have like a chronic illness problem. Like, do we have like a heart disease problem? Do we have like a diabetes problem? Um, yeah. Like we have those things. Do we have a, like a nutritional issue in our culture? Like, a, you know, large nutritional issues in our culture where people like don't have access to vegetables and produce and things that help them balance their blood sugars and like maintain their good health. Yeah, we have all of those problems. We have all of those problems. Um, but, you know, pegging that all on fatness is really um, uh, misguided, right? Because what we're doing is instead of actually dealing with the real problems that we have, which are things like industrial corn syrup and like, you know, like all of these different issues that are impacting people's health and creating problems like diabetes and heart disease and, you know, all of these various different things that are going on, we immediately are just like, you know, this thing that may be correlated with, you know, basically like poor health behaviors, um, which by and large are often also not the fault of the individual. In most instances in our cult culture, it's like access issues and, you know, socioeconomics and, you know, all sorts of other complicated things. Um, but for the most part, like, it's, it's really, really problematic in our culture that we, instead of talking about, you know, oh, we have a diabetes epidemic. Oh, we have a chronic illness epidemic. Oh, we have like an industrial food food problem. Like instead of really talking about the actual issues, we just like peg it all on weight when weight in and of itself is not really the issue, right? Like fat, like heart disease, like diabetes, for instance, isn't necessarily caused by being fat. Diabetes is caused by having like blood sugar regulation issues. And one of the symptoms of that may also be weight gain, right? Like it's like, it's sort of like, um, there is, um, a really famous researcher who I love in this field, her name's Linda Bacon. She wrote a super, super important book called Health at Every Size, which basically she says, you know, blaming our health epidemic, uh, our poor health epidemic on fat is like blaming lung cancer on having yellow teeth, right? Mm. Like, it's like, you know, just because people who have yellow teeth are more likely to have lung cancer doesn't necessarily mean that having yellow teeth causes lung cancer. If you went around and whitened everyone's teeth, it wouldn't make the lung cancer go away. Maybe there's this third thing, this other third public health issue called smoking happening. That's the real issue behind, you know, lung cancer and yellow teeth, right? And that's what we actually have to deal with. And that's sort of what's going on with, you know, our, you know, health crisis in this country, right? Is that, you know, we have a really, we have really, really complicated health problems, chronic health problems in our country, in this country that are caused by lots of, that are just super systemic and super institutional, again, industrial corn subsidies, all of these different things that are creating problems like diabetes, heart disease, you know, et cetera, et cetera. And it's very lazy of us as a culture to just like call that fat, call the problem fat, because fat is, when fat is really just like, sort of like a, it's a correlative issue, right? It's correlated to these uh, health issues, right? It's correlated basically to like a major nutritional issue that we have in our culture and in our country. But fat itself is like this, it's like almost like a third level issue. It's like almost like this like side issue and we're blaming everything on it. Like assuming that if, like, if we can just make people thinner, we can get rid of all of these like health problems that we're having. When in reality, what ends up happening when you try to make people thinner is that they go on and off the wagon. It's, it's again, you have all of the issues that come from putting people on diets, right? So it's like you have somebody who's, you know, whatever weight they are, like higher weight ranged person who has diabetes and you say, okay, go on a diet and lose weight. What is 95% chance going to happen is that they are going to lose weight temporarily and gain it back and lose weight and gain it back and lose weight and gain it back, which by the way, is probably going to make various different health problems worse. Yo-yo dieting going up and down and up and down and up and down, especially for heart disease. Yo-yo dieting going up and down and up and down is significantly more um, problematic for your cardiac health than just like staying still at a higher weight and like just taking care as best you can of your body at whatever, you know, weight your, your body wants to be. Now, will some people, if they were, you know, able to change their behaviors, lose weight? Yes. But what ends up happening also when we throw the dart and just blame fat is that people who are naturally a little bit bigger get screwed over and get poor healthcare, right? Especially like now one of the, um, 
I hope I'm not getting too sciencey here, but so one of the big issues that's also happened in our culture is we have, you know, basically decided that instead of this as being a systemic issue, you know, that has to do with like our food systems and all these kinds of other issues. Instead of this being a food a systemic issue, we've decided it's an independent willpower issue and it's up to the individual to make sure that they're no longer fat, right? Or to make sure they're, they don't get diabetes or all of these issues. Um, and one of the ways that uh, our, basically our government, right? Like this was in the early nineties, decided they were going to try to help people become healthier was to like literally just decide, oh, we're going to tell people that a healthy BMI range is significantly thinner. We're going to move the average. We're going to move these like sort of arbitrary healthy BMI ranges from, you know, 20 to 28 and we're going to push it down to 25 to 18 to motivate people to lose weight. So basically we're just going to decide arbitrarily that the new healthy weight is thinner than we used to think it was to motivate people to lose weight because we're, you know, seeing these increases in weight related illnesses. This is a disaster because what ends up happening is that people who are just naturally BMI 25, like I'm BMI 25. Technically, I'm on the cusp of overweight, according to like clinical science. And like anyone walking down the street would call me a normatively thin person. Like there is like, I am a, you know, super, super healthy. Like it is insane. Like, it, like it's, it, it's amazing to me when people talk about the obesity epidemic, they don't realize that the obesity epidemic technically includes people who basically look like me, who anyone walking down the street would think I was normatively thin, right? Like I'm like a size eight, 10, maybe on land and five, six, you know, like, no one would consider me part of this obesity epidemic, right? But like, this is how the numbers are skewed, right? So a lot of this is like fear mongering, first of all. Um, but yeah, like, so, you know, in blaming all of these health issues on weight, wait, 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 that's the problem, that's the problem, that's the problem, basically taking no responsibility for all the systemic issues that are creating actual health issues like heart disease and diabetes, um, people who are just naturally a little bigger end up getting screwed. They end up getting trapped in the diet rate, diet race, rat, rat, excuse me, diet race, rat race. <laughs> they end up getting trapped in the diet rat race and end up having significantly worse health outcomes, including like psychological problems, mental health problems. Dieting is like heavily correlated with anxiety, depression, suicide. I mean, eating disorders are like the high, most fatal mental illness that exists, right? Like basically people who are just naturally higher weight with, who are completely healthy, normal people get trapped in, you know, this really, 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 really screwed up cycle. So I would say that, you know, are people fat because of dieting? I think people, I think like the rise in weights in our culture in the past, let's call it like 30, 40 years is like super complicated. And there's like a lot of different reasons. Again, some of them just systemic that have nothing to do with dieting, potentially some of them having to do with dieting. That's certainly a theory that is out there that makes some sense. Um, but I think the bigger issue is that like, you know, some people are just naturally bigger. I think the bigger issue with pegging all weight related illnesses in quotes on fatness and blaming fatness for everything rather than like actual health behaviors um, is that like people who are naturally larger bodied are basically discriminated against in our medical system and end up getting like really, really, really screwed up care. I mean, it's just unethical to like put these people on diets when like we know that the reality is that they're just going to rebound and it's like not there's no evidence that it's actually helpful for a lot of people i mean people it, it gets really really complicated really fast um so yeah so anyway this researcher who i mentioned earlier who um wrote this book called health at every size you know like her real call to action which is you know a becoming a major movement um, in the health industry is let's stop focusing on weight and actually start focusing on healthy behaviors. Like it doesn't matter what I weigh if I'm like working out on a regular basis and eating vegetables and balancing my blood sugar. Like those are the things that are important. What weight I end up at the end is whatever weight my body's supposed to be. Like if I focus on weight instead of focusing on behaviors, I'm just going to go up and down and up and down and up and down. I'm just going to end up like in the diet rat race, like with all the hell that comes with that, you know, potentially more and more disordered eating and psychological issues and just all sorts of crap. Whereas if we just taught people like take care of the body you have, you know, eat your vegetables, like, you know, move your body on a regular basis, manage stress, get enough sleep, drink water, right? Like just encourage people to just take care of the bodies that are their own rather than like shaming people and trying to constantly get people to like jam their square peg of a body into a round hole we would have a lot less um, secondary symptoms from like weight discrimination in our, in our, in our culture. 
Okay, so you just probably officially became my favorite person because when somebody like teaches me something new or shows me an area of ignorance in my own life, like, oh my gosh, like Isabel, like you have blown my mind. Like I am, I am like almost teary because wow, like I have never heard any of this stuff. I've never heard it talked about this. I've never been on, I mean, it's un, unbelievable. And if you are not writing a book, like you please need to write a book. <laughs> like this is so so important and how you talk about it, how you articulate it, it like instantly makes sense to me. We were in, um, we were driving a road trip back through from Oklahoma, through Nebraska, through Kansas, whatever. I had my kids in the car, <clears throat> can't find a Whole Foods anywhere, uh, trying to find like the grocery stores in a Walmart, uh, trying to find something that is reasonable to feed my children. I literally can't do it. Like I was in tears in the car because I was like telling my husband, I was like, there is nothing in that store that isn't drenched in pesticides or isn't completely like packaged. And like, there's, so I end up just giving them like whatever Cheetos because like there's nothing that I could, there was no, and I was like, there's no access. Yeah. And I have forgotten that memory. It was two and a half years ago. And I was so fired up about it and so upset about it. And I just like, it slipped my mind. And I do live in this bubble in in Colorado and you know, we have like lots of vitamin cottages on every street and like, we're really blessed in that way. But, um, what you said is just so true. I just visited my aunt in Tennessee and it was really, really difficult to find baby food that I wanted to feed my baby. Um, and I, and I have this level of awareness around food that's like pretty high because my parents grew up hippies in the mountains, growing their own food, raising me very clean, all this stuff. And so like to hear you say that, wow, I, my mind is just like blown right now. Like I, I have, it just really exposed this point of ignorance in myself that I was completely unaware of. And I just appreciate you so much for that. And I do hope you write a book because holy cow, like you need to like shout this from the rooftops. This is unreal girl. Oh my gosh. Yay. I am so, that literally makes me so happy because like, this is why I do this work is so that like to like teach people, because it's so important. By the way, I have to say, I am definitely not the only person talking about this stuff. There is like a whole like underground movement happening. Like let's take the focus off of weight. Like let's just like, like relax about the numbers and just actually focus on what really matters, which is like helping people like do healthy things and have access to healthy things. And like, let's focus on access and behaviors and the institutional problems that are causing all of these health issues. Like we're blaming everything on fat and it is like so damaging, like psychologically, like it is damaging on so many different physically it's damaging like it's just like it's a nightmare and it just doesn't help anyone or do anything like all it does is like exacerbate like disordered eating and all of the different like health consequences of yo-yo dieting you know all of this crap so I'm just like so I'm so happy to hear your reaction because I'm like yeah like this is this is the real issue it's like we are all like so distracted by this weight conversation over here it's actually just keeping us from talking about the real issues which are things like access which are things like you know, um, the fact that like you have to drive 50 miles to like get out of a food desert in like most of this country, you know, and, and all of these other issues. So, you know, I just think the weight conversation in, in many ways, it's, it's really, it is, it is, it's letting our government off of the hook of actually having to like maintain a healthful environment. Like at the end of the day, we are animals. Like we're not robots. Like we do have biological instincts around food. Like if you put us in a poisonous environment, we're gonna get poisoned. Like we don't, you know, if you like, we don't have an awesome ability to like navigate a poison environment, nor should we have to, right? Um, and so, you know, blaming individuals for getting poisoned when they live in a poisoned environment is not useful, right? Like, it's, not, like, it's completely, um, and one of the ways that the government basically pegs, you know, basically says like, it's your fault for getting sick is through this whole like diet culture um, paradigm. So like, it really just needs to go, you know? <laughs> like, I'm, I'm sold. I, I see that like it's when you hear something that's true, you just can't help. Like, I'm never going to not know that. Like, this has been, just been such a, a beautiful hour for me because I'm like, wow, it's just amazing. So yeah. I know that a lot of people um, who are listening probably do struggle with, with feeling crazy around food and with binging and with um, replacing some of their binge drinking. And I know that it's totally different, but I do think that people have a tendency and I've, I've talked to dozens of women who like, those, those for them, the binge eating, the binge drinking, like they have to both go at once or neither one of them go actually, because if they start drinking, they start eating vice versa. Um, but if, if people really 
you know, what you said has, has resonated, especially as much as it has with me. Where can people find you and, and where can people learn more and get more involved? Yes. And I just want to make one comment about like the drinking and binging. So another thing that we should know about drinking and binging, and this is also research that's in that book, Health at Every Size, that I referenced earlier, is that one of the, so it's interesting, dieters tend to quote, lose control around food when either experiencing emotions or when under the influence of alcohol or drugs, mm. right? Because what ends up happening, it kills your willpower, right? It's like right. people are, if you're trying to like control yourself around food all day, the reason you binge when you're drunk is not because you're drunk. It's because when you're drunk, your willpower goes out the window. And all of a sudden it's just like the floodgates are gonna open. You're gonna do everything you want, right? It's like all of your, right? So it's just like something to be aware of. Um, what I would say, it's interesting. It's like, you know, like my, you know, managing the drinking and managing the food, it's like complicated because they, I think there's a, ten, there's this, there's this idea of like, I have to like get rid of the binging and the drinking together. But I think, you know, for most people with food issues, again, there's this third issue called dieting that really predisposes all of the binge eating and emotional eating and all of these different kinds of things. And what ends up happening when people, you know, you know, there's various different reasons I think where why food issues flare up after people quit drinking. But one of the reasons is also when people quit drinking, like dieting is also very compulsive, right? And it's like, all of a sudden I'm not drinking. I'm not just like zoned out all the time. I'm like, I'm going to get in shape. I'm going to like, you know, get my life together. It's like when people are sober, they go on these like, health kicks, right? And then often if those health kicks are like, oh my gosh, I got to lose weight, what ends up happening is they end up getting caught up in the diet binge cycle. And that's super, super, super common. Like I cannot tell you how many people I know who quit drinking and like it's such a, it's, so, it's part of sobriety culture. Like even in like 12 step fellowship stuff, like I hear this all the time, like it's part of sobriety culture of like, I'm going to like, you know, get healthy, which is really great. But if you're living in a culture which equates weight and health, now you're just in the diet rat, rat race. And now you just have like a different cycle that you have to get out of. So that is really, really common experience. Um, and again, there's like the whole thing with the calories and like ap alcohol can appetite suppress and blah, 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 right? Like there's a lot. And, and yeah. again, if anyone's interested in this conversation, I have a lot more to say about it. So yes, take a look. Well, at I'd, my love to, I'd love to have you back because I'd love to dig into this a little bit more. Um, yeah. Because especially because when you said, and I wrote it down, you said salvation can only come... Um, or satiation can only come in a land of permission and allowance. That really resonated with me because I feel like with my, with drinking, it was at that moment that I decided that I was going to stop trying to stop, that I actually learned enough about what was going on and what the substance of alcohol was that I took away my desire to actually drink. Now I know it's different because you can say, I'm never going to, I don't want to drink anymore. You yeah. can't say I don't want to eat anymore. And so that right. complicates eating obviously so much, but right. I just really felt like that really rang true for me. Like it was, that point of permission. Mm -hmm. And I still say like, I just don't want to drink. It's not that I'm never going to drink again, because as soon as I say that, like you said before, it's like the kid don't touch the toy and yeah. I get super like, ah, um, yeah. but anyway, so that's so good. So yeah. So where let's definitely like plan another one, but where can we part two? Yes, we have to. It's amazing. We talk to you all day. <laughs> there's so much, there's so much going on. And it's interesting because like, I, you know, I mean, I've been doing this work for so long. Like I know a lot of like the intricacies of like, okay, so like what happens with like, how does this interact with sobriety and how does this, you know, there's all these different like little nuances to talk about. So yeah, I could talk about this all day and it's something I don't get to talk about, you know, on other podcasts as much. So I'm in, but um, right. yeah, if people are like, huh, I want to know more about what you're talking about. And I don't think you're a total crazy person yet. Um, go to stopfightingfood.com. That's definitely like the place to get like, you know, it's a, it's you, I mean, you've taken my video training series. It's like a really, you know, just okay. easy introduction. Like here are some core concepts. Like, let's get you thinking about this differently. Some of the things we talked about, I did not mention today. Some of the things we did, like, um, a big one is the difference between emotional eating and binge eating. That's like a huge, 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 must, must, must understand concept. Um, and yeah, so stopfightingfood.com, sign up for the video training series. It's like super beautiful and fun and like awesome. Um, and then, I mean, if people want to even go deeper, you can also check out my blog, um, isabelfoxandduke.com, which is, you know, like reads like a book, like it reads like a novel. It, it kind of is like, you know, a first quarter or something of my book. It's like a beginning of my book maybe. Um, and you know, that's a really, really great way to like, also kind of like, just get a completely new perspective on this food issue. Cause the way most people are thinking about food is just 
making the problem worse. Like it's just actually like pushing them down this like progressive diet binge cycling. And they often don't even realize they're dieting. I mean, most, I would say 75% of my clients just don't, they don't identify as dieters. They're just like, I'm just trying to be healthier. I'm just trying to this, or I'm just trying to like not eat like too much or whatever. And they don't realize that they're actually like clinging on, hanging off the side of a cliff, trying not to eat something or some way. And then like, it's like inevitable that like, they're going to lose their grip and fall off and it's going to be like a disaster, you know? Um, so yeah. So isabelfoxandduke.com is where my blog is, but the video training series is like also like really like a just super solid intro. Stopfightingfood.com. Yeah. I echo that. It was amazing. I took it like two or three years ago and it was, it was so good. So that's awesome. Yay! All right. Thank you so much, Isabel. I really appreciate it. It's been awesome. Thank you. This has been Annie Grace with This Naked Mind Podcast. Thank you so much for listening. You can learn more at thisnakedmind.com and please remember to rate, review, and subscribe as it really helps us spread the word.